Oh, I know. They did that test. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we are going to continue our walk through the gut, through the GI tract. And when we left off last time, uh, we had pointed out that as we leave the stomach, As we leave the stomach, we are moving into the small intestine, which is where we are going to see a lot of digestion and absorption happening, particularly in that first 20% of the small intestine, which is specialized in a number of ways to increase the surface area uh, where we have the ability to do that exchange. So absorption is gonna be moving our nutrients from the lumen of the gut tube into the actual internal environment of the body. So into the cells themselves. Uh, so if we were looking at those cells, we'd see a brush border with microvilli on it. We'd see larger projecting structures in the wall of the small intestine called villi. And in general, uh, we see this kind of lumpy kind of structure. We see these crypts of Lieberkuhn as well, which is part of where we are going to have secretions building up. Because we know that as we're leaving the stomach, we have this uh, super acidic chyme coming out uh, due to all that stomach acid that has been mixed in. And we're going to need that bicarbonate rich fluid in order to make sure that we don't damage our own tissue. So as we are moving into the small intestine, first we are going to be crossing into the duodenum. So that's where we go first. Okay. Did, did I do something out of order? I'm just hearing it. Okay, I saw a bunch of flipping. I wanted to make sure I'm in the right spot. Okay, so as we're moving into the small intestine, the first part is the duodenum. So it's this C-shaped kind of curvature following the stomach. So part of it we would see here behind uh, this small intestine and the colon actually as well that's covering it over here. And in the duodenum, Secretions are gonna be really important. So the duodenum is where we're gonna see the delivery of a bunch of enzymes from the pancreas and the liver, okay? So there's going to be food in the form of chyme. So that food mixed with stomach acid coming out of the stomach, out of the pylorus, the pyloric sphincter leading into the duodenum. Hopefully you saw those in lab, but not that's lab stuff anyway, not for us. So we're in the duodenum, came from the stomach. So we're not done breaking down molecules. So we need to continue that digestive process. So we've got a bunch of digestive enzymes, especially in pancreatic juice. So coming from one of our accessory organs, the pancreas, we're gonna see lots of enzyme production there. We're gonna see more bicarbonate being produced. So we have some forming in the walls of the small intestine itself in those crypts of Lieberkuhn. But we also have a lot of bicarbonate uh, coming in in that pancreatic juice uh, because we really want to neutralize that chyme. Okay. The other thing that we're going to see in terms of secretions into the duodenum, so we're going to see that our liver, which will be located up about here, um, is secreting bile that's ultimately going to help us digest fats. Uh, so bile is also going to enter the GI tract at the duodenum. Um, your gallbladder also links up to your biliary system, but it's really a kind of like a holding cell for extra bile. So that's why we see our bile ducts all communicating with each other because that bile is coming from the liver, meeting up with our cystic duct from the gallbladder together going into the duodenum when we want to digest a fatty meal. We'll talk about how we digest each of our different kind of 
types of macromolecules in order. So, so we'll be doubling back on some of these things as well. Okay. So since we're taught, we are mentioning that we're trying to balance out that acidity in the chyme, um, I wanna see if we can remember or look back at the figure and figure out which of those cell types in the stomach was making the chyme or sorry, making the acidity, making all those, secreting all those hydrogen ions that's making the chyme and the stomach on the whole really acidic. Okay, take another couple seconds to make a choice. Ooh, okay, so we got a kind of widespread here. So these were some of the different types of cells that we saw in the lining of the stomach. So this is where we looked at that zoomed in wall of the stomach and we saw those gastric pits. So we had a neck down into the gastric pits, those neck cells making mucus. Uh, G cells are associated with the hormone gastrin, which is one of our kind of endocrine functions here to the stomach. And it's the parietal cells that are making basically our hydrochloric acid, as well as some intrinsic factor, which helps us absorb vitamin B12. One of the functions that we're going to see of that acidity of those hydrogen ions coming from the parietal cells is to activate what's coming from the chief cells, which is the pepsinogen, which is a molecule that's going to turn into an enzyme that helps us break down proteins. Uh, so it's going to turn the pepsinogen into the activated form pepsin. I expect you to remember that right this second, but by the time we come back at the end of the unit, you wanna make sure that you know what we're making in the stomach, where these things are coming from. Okay. So continuing to walk through. So we've gone into the small intestine. We're in the duodenum. Our pancreatic duct is linking up here. We have pancreatic enzymes coming in, our carbonate rich fluid. And we've just mentioned that the liver um, puts bile salts to aid in fat digestion uh, in the GI tract, but the liver has kind of multiple different roles in the abdomen. So we know uh, when we talked about the circulatory system and our cardiovascular system, right? We know that clotting factors are coming from the liver. Um, so now we know that the liver is making bile which we're gonna see how that works with relationship to fat digestion. Um, the liver is also kind of acting as a filter a little bit when we think about blood flow through the abdomen. So usually when we have blood flow places, we've got uh, arteries mostly coming out of some part or some branch off the aorta. Then we have veins coming back to some portion of the vena cava, that's our sort of big picture, usual pathway for blood. Um, but the abdomen is special in part because venous blood, so that, that blood that's full of waste products potentially, and in the case of the abdomen, these food products, these molecules that we're absorbing from our food, they don't go straight back into your circulation. They don't go straight back into the vena cava and into your heart immediately. Um, they first go through a portal system in your liver. So we're acting as, as a kind of barrier here in this portal system where it can do a little bit of modification, processing, and detoxifying 
before that blood gets mixed in with all the rest of the blood um, already circulating through your body. So the liver has a sort of detoxification function in addition to the ways in which it helps you actually process nutrients and process food. So we call this system of venous blood that's going through the liver before it goes back to your heart and everywhere else, uh, the hepatic portal system. So anytime you see that word hepatic, that means liver. Portal systems um, have to do with like multiple kind of like capillary beds coming near each other. We talked about them in the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Here we're thinking about blood flow in the liver and also blood flow kind of on the sides of our GI tract here as being those kind of multiple capillary beds we're looking at. So the way you would absorb some kind of molecule from the GI tract from a kind of pathway perspective, so you're probably going to be absorbing it across the wall of the small intestine, right? First 20% of the small intestine is where almost all of our absorption is happening. So we're going to go into the veins flowing back from the small intestine. So this is going to be some type of mesenteric vein in the mesentery. So that kind of like fatty looking tissue structure that's holding the small intestine to the posterior wall of the abdomen. All right, so we're traveling back through that vein, through the mesentery. We're going to be going ultimately into our hepatic portal vein. So this really large vein that's flowing all this blood from our intestines through the liver here. Okay, so we're going to go into the liver through the hepatic portal vein. Um, and ultimately, we're going to come out the other side of the liver through the hepatic vein and then go into the vena cava and rejoin the rest of circulation. Um, but in the liver, we can do additional processing, detoxification. We have a number of kind of like different structures that aid in this. There is also oxygen going to uh, the liver. So the arterial flow to the liver just looks normal. We just have uh, a branch off your celiac trunk ultimately coming off the aorta, the hepatic artery going into your liver. So nothing, nothing strange about the arterial flow, just a kind of specialized situation here with the veins. So after we pass through the small intestine, we are going to move into our large intestine. So the parts of the large intestine in order are going to be the cecum. So this is basically that this big kind of bag-like looking structure. Your appendix comes off of it uh, in your right lower quadrant. Okay. Then we're going to go into the colon, which has ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid parts, just referring to where they are, the shape of them. And okay. before we then go into the rectum and the anus. Okay. So some more details here. When we're talking about the transition from small intestine to large intestine, that point is gonna happen right here between your ileum, which is the final part of the small intestine, and the cecum, which is the first part of your large intestine. So there's a sphincter here. The ileocecal sphincter is in this ileocecal junction. It's allowing for a little bit of control here. Okay. If we look at the large intestine as a whole, we're gonna see that we have a big longitudinal band of smooth muscle running down it. This is something called the tinea coli. So we can see that line here along, uh, tracing along our colon here. Overall, um, the colon large intestine is another hollow tube. It's wider in diameter than the small intestine, which is why it's our large intestine. We name its parts based on where they are, what they look like. Uh, we have a couple of different kind of functions when we think about our large intestine and specifically our colon. Mainly what we're gonna be doing here uh, is solidifying feces. So we're gonna be absorbing water and we're gonna be concentrating waste into feces. Okay. We also, since we have a big wide diameter pathway here, we're really kind of just storing feces until defecation. So until we're ready to eliminate that waste. So from a like 
let's say texture perspective, right? So each food, you chew it up, it's kind of slimy. You covered it with your spit, your saliva, you swallowed it down. That saliva helped lubricate as you go through the esophagus. In the stomach, you mix in with various gastric juices, especially um, that super acidic uh, hydrochloric acid kind of coming out of the gastric pits in the stomach. You turned everything all around and you've made thyme, which is kind of like smoothie texture. As you pass into the duodenum, we're adding pancreatic juice, we're adding bile, so we're adding more fluids. All right, so we've got a very liquidy kind of fluid material traveling through the small intestine and ending up in the colon. So as we pass through the colon, we're trying to make sure that we don't get rid of too much water. We know we want to conserve the amount of water in our body, right? That's something we are controlling with our kidneys, um, but we want to make sure we don't lose too much water through our GI tract either. Yeah. And we want to make uh, sure that our waste is of a um, good texture. So we're, we're going to be concentrating waste into feces and keeping that water in our bodies. Okay. So that's what's going to be going on in the colon rather than like digestion and absorption of nutrients. So from the colon, we go into the rectum. Rect means like straight up and down. So the rectum is straight up and down leading to the anus, which is where defecation occurs. So actually excreting whatever is left going through the anus. Um, your anus actually has multiple sphincters to it. You have both an internal and an external anal sphincter. So kind of like what was going on when we were talking about the urethra and urination. Uh, so for these two sphincters, the internal one is made of smooth muscle and the external one is made of skeletal muscle. So we have this combination of like a sphincter that is subject to physiologic demands. So like stuff you don't know about is affecting the internal anal sphincter because it's smooth muscle. It's not under your control, but we do also have the ability to control defecation, which is why it's important that that external anal sphincter be made of skeletal muscle because skeletal muscle is the type of muscle that's under your voluntary control. Okay. So you got to relax both of these sphincters in order to open the passageway and allow for defecation. So some of that opening is going to come from pressure influencing that smooth muscle in the internal anal sphincter, but the other side is under your control with that skeletal muscle and that external anal sphincter. Okay. So that's the overview of the tract. Now we're going to focus in a little more on the glands uh, that are making all our enzymes and juices that allow us to digest our food products. So like to break down the molecules. Okay. So we're gonna have glands that have ducts that ultimately go into different parts of the GI tract. And this actually starts in your mouth. So your salivary glands are glands and we consider them accessory glands for our gastrointestinal system because they are associated with uh, digestion and eating and all that good stuff. So our first type of gland that we'll actually see the salivary glands secreting saliva. So we mentioned that saliva acts as a lubricant for food and we also have some enzymes in it, particularly some salivary amylase that actually starts the chemical digestion process for some types of molecules. Okay. Then we travel through esophagus, stomach, duodenum. The duodenum is receiving pancreatic juices coming from the pancreas. So the next gland that we'll talk about is the pancreas. In general, when we look at a gland and see its structure, we're gonna see that, that that lumpy kind of fatty looking tissue that you might've seen in lab when you like squeeze a gland or touch it. What that's actually made up is made up of is these clusters of uh, epithelial cells specialized for secretion called a semi. So we can see those here. So that's what these little branching tubes are. So we have these acini, these kind of globes leading into our duct system. So we can see secretion going into a tube and into a duct that will ultimately lead into the digestive tract. 
And so we'll we'll focus on that, particularly when we look at the pancreas and what different things the pancreas is secreting. And then our last type of gland, liver does a bunch of stuff. One of the things the liver is doing is secreting bile. So that's kind of like a glandular function there to the liver. Okay. So starting at the top with the saliva, right? So when you're producing saliva, it can be of multiple types depending on whether you're eating or not. Saliva um, does in general keep your mouth moist even when you're not eating, which is helpful. Um, but when we're looking at saliva, we're going to see in general, that it's pretty rich in bicarbonate ions. We want buffering action to happen right at the top, actually, right? Whether you eat super acidic food or not. We've got mucus in the saliva, and we've got some enzymes. So we have the enzyme salivary amylase that is going to begin uh, carbohydrate digestion. And we also have something called lysozyme. And this really acts almost as an immune defense. This, this helps you kind of like attack bacteria and stuff uh, to some extent when you eat food. So you have a little bit of protection kind of in the saliva there. The next gland down, the pancreas is complicated. Um, so the pancreas has both exocrine portions and endocrine portions. So we've mentioned this before, actually, because when we talked about our endocrine system, uh, we were talking about the islets of Langerhans and the production of insulin and glucagon. That was the endocrine function of the pancreas. Uh, so now that we're talking about enzymes, we're talking about the exocrine portion. So the secretion part. Okay. So the pancreatic juice is a secretion made by the exocrine portion of the pancreas, which is larger than the endocrine portion, but they're all kind of like intermixed together. Okay. So here we see uh, those acini with those specialized epithelial cells. Here they're labeled acinar cells because they're in the acini, secreting various types of enzymes leading into ducts, right? Zooming us in on that exocrine pancreas here. Um, the islets, of Langerhans, those endocrine parts would just be these purple dots. So you can see how there are fewer of them. Okay. So in that pancreatic juice, we got more bicarbonate. Um, your pancreas actually really makes a ton of protein, which sounds crazy until you think about the fact that all the enzymes that it's making to help in digestion, enzymes are proteins. Uh, so relative to the weight of the pancreas, it makes, um, a really substantial amount of protein that's ending up in the secretions, ultimately going into your duodenum here. Um, so in terms of what those enzymes are, we're gonna have pancreatic amylase. So pancreatic amylase is going to be associated with carbohydrate digestion, just like the salivary amylase was. We're gonna have pancreatic lipases. So that's gonna be associated with lipids. So that's fat digestion. And we're going to have some proteases for breaking down proteins and even some nucleases. So we could break down like nucleic acids and stuff if we wanted. So really the pancreas can break down pretty much anything with these pancreatic juices. So next gland, the liver. The liver is secreting its bile. So here we are zoomed in on the liver so that we can see the biliary system. Uh, so here we can see hepatic ducts in the liver leading into the common hepatic duct. Here's our little gallbladder connected to all of this with the cystic duct. So if we have extra bile or we're not eating right now, we can produce, put some bile into the gallbladder and save it for later. When we actually do want to digest a meal, we'd put the bile into this common bile duct and go into the duodenum. Coming out this little location, that actually has some control around it. The sphincter of Odi controls the flow of fluids out of the ampulla of Bader into the duodenum. And so we can see that that point where the uh, liver and the bile are entering, the, yeah, the bile from the liver, I should say, are entering the duodenum. That's the same point at which we have the pancreatic duct with all its pancreatic juices entering the duodenum. So we're getting a real big push of 
enzymes and salts and all the things we need to fully digest a meal right here at the beginning of the small intestine. Yeah. So the liver is able to secrete bile to help with fat digestion. And it also does some processing of nutrients. So we know we just mentioned that we have a portal system. So venous blood, which is where we have everything that we're absorbing from the intestines has to like stop through the liver before it can go to the rest of your body, before it can go to your heart. Now, uh, with those nutrients that are coming in to the liver through those veins before they go anywhere else, uh, the liver can take glucose coming in uh, and turn it into glycogen. So we can have glycogen stored in the liver, ready to peel off glucose molecules whenever we need them to make ATP. The liver can also take amino acids and actually turn them into fatty acids for kind of long-term uh, storage. Um, and it can also make basically fats. So it can make triglycerides uh, and cholesterol. So other types of lipids can be synthesized in the liver from various components of food that you're absorbing. And it also even makes uh, some structures called lipoproteins. So we're jamming together lipids and proteins together. So for this big kind of combination molecule. Uh, so these are some of the things we mean when we say that the liver is doing processing of nutrients. Okay. Other functions that we've seen before to some extent, right? So we know that the liver is also involved in the life cycle of our red blood cells, our erythrocytes. Uh, so we saw before um, that this is one of the places where breaking down hemoglobin, right? so catabolizing hemoglobin, pulling it apart, making it smaller is one of the things that we're going to do if we have an old, not very functional red blood cell. We want to break down that hemoglobin partially so that we can keep the heme part, so we can keep the iron, so we don't have to eat too much dietary iron. Uh, so as part of that process of breaking down hemoglobin, we create bilirubin. Okay? So that's one of the things that's going to be in with that bile. We are also, um, yeah, just in general, that, that bilirubin is going to be eliminated with the feces. So uh, in with the bile salts that we're using for digestion, that bilirubin is entering the digestive tract and ending up at the other end. Um, that bilirubin is part of why feces are generally brown is that it has a color to it. Okay. The liver also makes plasma proteins. So we mentioned that particularly those clotting factors and does some secretion and modification of hormones as well. So overall, most important part of the biliary system is the liver itself, that big organ. We know we need these ducts to deliver our bile and bile salts down into the duodenum. Um, but we've also got other organs here, part of the system, particularly the gallbladder, storing any extra bile. Um, these are words I already said before. So here we have that gallbladder joining up cystic duct to that common hepatic duct, forming a common bile duct. So whether it's new bile coming directly from the liver, or saved bile coming from the gallbladder, we're putting it down into the duodenum through that ampulla of Vader. And ampulla just means a swelling. So the reason there's two words there is that the duct looks kind of wider here where it enters the duodenum. And then the sphincter of Odi is just, there's actually like a flap and a sphincter structure here, allowing us to control this movement of fluids into the duodenum. If we were to zoom in on the internal structure of the liver, uh, we would see this kind of most tiled looking pattern here to it. Uh, so in order to the, make the bile, we're taking material from the blood that's coming in. We're taking it into structures called sinusoids, uh, into liver cells, which formally are called hepatocytes. So hepato for liver, sites for cells. So the hepatocytes are the cells that are making the bile and they secrete that bile into little bile cannulae that are lying 
next to the sinusoids. And ultimately, it's those cannuliculi that are draining into the bile ducts and then ultimately into the common hepatic duct. Um, so that's what's going on inside the liver. Cool. Here's a big overview of these different organs. And just, you know, for, for our purposes, including this liver anatomy stuff, um, because I know that the other sections of, of this class do cover this, I believe. Um, but this is, this is a lower priority function. This is a lower priority piece of material versus understanding digestion and absorption. That's, that's really what we ultimately want to understand from this portion of the unit is how do we break the food down? Where is it? Where does it go and why? Cool. And this is our sort of sheet full of reminders of what all these things do. Okay. So we're going to move into that actual absorption part now. So we're going to go through the different molecule types uh, one by one. We're going to not really talk about nucleic acids because that's not a major thing that you're doing uh, when you're eating food. But we're going to talk about how are you digesting and absorbing carbs? How are you digesting and absorbing proteins? How are you digesting and absorbing lipids one by one? And think about how this interacts with the different enzymes and different glands as we go through the GI tract. Okay. So we're going to start out with carbs, then go to proteins, lipids. Then I'll talk at the end a little bit about vitamins and minerals. Talk about water, which is going to be integrated into our understanding of the large intestine. The rest of this stuff, we're, we're really thinking small intestine mainly. Okay. We're going to start with those carbohydrates. Right. So Say you're eating some crackers, right? So crackers made of starch, carbohydrate digestion. The only type of carbohydrate molecule that you can actually get across your cell layer so that you can actually get into a cell is a monosaccharide. So you need it to be just like one little ring when you actually take it into the cell. So think about like, when we've seen glucose, right? We've seen all sorts of glucose transporters. We know we can pull glucose into a cell. We can't pull a big branching starch molecule in, right? So you can see that we have lots and lots of monosaccharides or monomers linked together in this branching pattern if we're eating a starch. Okay. So in order to actually get any nutrition from starches, we need to break that larger molecule down into something that your cell actually can take into the body. Okay. So we got to break our big starch molecule. And then we got to break it again and again and again until we just have monosaccharides. Okay. So this process is going to take a little while from a pathway perspective. You're going to start in the mouth. So digestion of starch would start with your saliva, basically. You're chewing your food, you're chewing your crackers. Um, in the saliva that's lubricating that material that you're chewing, you're going to have salivary amylase starting to break down our starch molecule into smaller chunks. Okay. So what salivary amylase can do, and this is also a similar function to what pancreatic amylase can do, so we can break that starch into little groups of two into disaccharides, or we can kind of break off the corners. It's hard to get in at these corners if you're an amylase enzyme. Um, so the other product we'd end up with when we apply that salivary amylase, something called limit dextrins. That's just talking about these, these kind of branch points that you see on the image here. Okay. So the salivary amylase starts that process. It's part of why like, you hold a cracker under your tongue for a while, it might start to taste kind of sweet. Uh, so you're actually starting to digest and break down those products and convert them into something that you might taste with your sweet receptors. So breaking them down into smaller sugars. Okay. But we're not all the way there yet. So you can't pull in these disaccharides or these limit dextrins. Uh, so we don't have a picture of the specific enzymes that would allow you to bring these in 
as monosaccharides, but we'd see other enzymes kind of embedded in the cell membranes of the absorptive cells in the GI tract that break these down into monosaccharides and let you pull them in. But from the perspective of the products of the glands that we do want to know, we've got the salivary amylase from our saliva glands. And then after we go through the stomach into the duodenum, our pancreas is linking up. And one of the enzymes in pancreatic juices is pancreatic amylase. So this process is ongoing as the food continues through your body. So that's what we want to know about our carbohydrates. We're going to spend a bit more time on proteins. Okay. So proteins, we will be talking about many different kinds of enzymes. For our carbohydrates, we're going to kind of leave it at the amylases, the salivary amylase and the pancreatic amylase. But when we're thinking about proteins, um, we've got a lot of different types of amino acids. And we've got a lot of different sized, different shaped proteins. So we need a number of kind of different steps and different ways of breaking down proteins. Okay. So when we have a protein, right, like it's all folded up in its tertiary and quaternary structure, when you swallow it down, it's your stomach, right? Stomach that acidity, that pH of two, one of the effects is that it denatures things. So denaturing means partially that that tertiary quaternary structure is gonna kind of unfold. So just the pH on its own starts to pull it into a nice long polypeptide, which is great because then we're just going to have something where we can actually start to attack bonds, right? Our peptide bonds, are what I'm drawing here is the lines, the beads on the string here are my amino acids. Okay. So our different types of proteases, ACE ending tells you it's an enzyme, prot here is for protein. Okay. So different types of proteases uh, have different effects, different actions when they attack our polypeptide. Okay. So our endopeptidases, are going to split our polypeptides at these internal bonds. So like an endopeptidase could come in, say, here, right? So we could break that bond. Or if we wanted, we could break this neighboring bond instead, something like that. So endo means inside. So inside of this polypeptide, we're breaking those interior bonds. An exopeptidase, can only break stuff off from the ends of our peptides. So exopeptidases could like pull off one from the end here, could pull off one from the end over there. Exo means from the outside. So we're chopping up our peptides in the middle with our endopeptidases. Exopeptidases are pulling amino acids off kind of one by one at the end. Um, then our zymogens are like our inactive enzymes for breaking down proteins. So that ogen ending, like when we see pepsinogen in the stomach, that ogen ending should be an indicator to you that it's not activated yet. It's a zymogen. So it's an inactive form of some type of enzyme, particularly an inactive form of a protease uh, stored in these granules. So zymogen granules usually exist. Um, they get secreted by cells through exocytosis, and then they have to be activated. And the way we activate them is that we break them a little bit. So they get activated by a process called proteolysis, proteo for protein, because the zymogens are enzymes, so they are themselves proteins. So in order to break down proteins, we have to start breaking down proteins. It's a kind of loop structure here which is part of why that hydrochloric acid in the stomach is important. Okay, so kind of thinking about this from a eating food perspective, okay? So there's not really anything in your saliva that's breaking down protein. There's not really anything in your esophagus that's breaking down protein other than like 
maybe you chewing, right? That mechanical kind of digestion. So the first thing that's happening to a protein, um, we got that denaturing and unfolding, helpful in that stomach acid, but our first actual enzymatic action is gonna be coming from the pepsinogen. Okay, so our pepsinogen is coming from those chief cells, right? So the chief cells in the gastric pits, right, are making our pepsinogen. Ogen ending is our signifier that this isn't activated yet, okay? So as that pepsinogen comes up and out of the gastric pit into the lumen of the stomach, so the hollow part of the stomach, it's gonna hit our hydrochloric acid coming from those parietal cells, right? So parietal cells secreting those hydrogen ions, that hydrochloric acid, making that stomach pH of two. And it's that acidity, that hydrochloric acid acidity that breaks the pepsin, unfolds it a little bit into its active form, which is called pepsin. Okay, so you can think like pepsinogen plus acid gives you pepsin. So it's the pepsin that actually does something in terms of breaking bonds. Okay. So the pepsin is coming here and it's breaking this protein into smaller fragments. We can see those smaller peptide fragments here. So don't have it on, on a list here, but this is kind of like one of those like endopeptidase kind of functions here, right? So breaking here into just smaller little chunks, right? So that is the action of pepsin in the stomach. We're not getting all the way towards individual amino acids at this point, but we're making this polypeptide chain smaller so that we can continue the digestive process. Okay. So from the stomach, we've got protein, we've broken it up a little bit with that pepsin that we activated with our stomach acid. So we've got like smaller chunks of polypeptides coming out of our pylorus into the duodenum. So we're in the small intestine now. As we go into the duodenum, the duodenum has that uh, pancreatic duct linking up with the duodenum. So what we're seeing, this says small intestine. It is small intestine, but specifically, we know we're in the duodenum because we can see that pancreatic duct. So like this would be by our ampulla of Vader and that sphincter of Odi, all the same kind of location here. Okay. So we're coming in. Our proteins are coming down. They're in little chunks, but they're not totally broken up yet. So now we are going to add in more enzymes that can break up proteins coming from the pancreas. So the pancreas is producing trypsin, trimotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. Okay. Um, they do come in in... Uh, inactivated form, and then they have to get activated, but those are those are our final forms that, that actually break up molecules. Uh, so here you can see them coming out of the pancreas through this pancreatic duct. Uh, so we can see how we have activated this trypsinogen into trypsin. Here we make that active chymotrypsin from the zymogen called chymotrypsinogen. And the procarboxypeptidase becomes the carboxypeptidase. So these are all going to be able to break down kind of like different types of uh, peptide bonds, different, different types of linking together amino acids. Now, I was pointing out that they're getting activated, especially this trypsinogen being activated here on the side, uh, because they're interacting with enzymes that are embedded in the walls of the small intestine. Uh, so we mentioned that a similar situation happens in carbohydrates. We're not naming any of those or looking at their pathways. Uh, but here we can see more detail uh, as we look at the protein. So here we can see a brush border protease. So an enzyme that breaks down proteins that's attached to this brush border. So it's attached to the outside part of this cell lining the small intestine. So we can see this enterokinase is what activated that trypsinogen into trypsin here. Okay. 
Another brush border protease that you would see is something called aminopeptidase. It's not on this picture, but it has a similar kind of function. So it has to wait till uh, protein fragments kind of bump into it in order to be able to do its enzymatic function. Okay. So in order to absorb amino acids, uh, we're going to need you know, like small or amino acids, ideally just one, right? And they're going to cross the membrane of a cell linked with sodium. So we're going to think about having like, here's my random small intestine cell. So that's my apical side. So I'm drawing those brush border uh, microvilli. Blood flow would go down here. Okay. So we are going to see amino acids being linked to sodium here. So we'd have an amino acid going in and we'd be following along a sodium gradient. So sodium's going along the same time. Okay. So this would have to be through secondary active uh, transport. So we would expect there to also be some sodium potassium pumps uh, keeping our sodium concentrations uh, flowing. So probably on the basolateral membrane. And once we have a bunch of amino acids here on in that cell lining the small intestine, then by facilitated diffusion, we can go into the blood on the opposite side. Okay. So that's what would happen with a single amino acid. We can sometimes do some absorption of dipeptides and tripeptides as well. So for carbohydrates, we needed a monosaccharide. Um, for proteins, we, we've got a little more wiggle room. So we can do some active transport across that apical membrane of a dipeptide or a tripeptide potentially, and then break down inside the cell to the individual monomers, those amino acids, and then have amino acids cross that basolateral membrane separately. So that situation would look something like, we're not going to draw a transporter on here. We're going to be real in specific about how they're coming across the apical membrane. But right, a dipeptide is just two amino acids linked, right? Or maybe we even have three, right? So we'd have some active transport of that di or tripeptide here, but we would need to break it up into its three amino acids and then individually let them diffuse across the basolateral membranes on the opposite side. Okay, so we'll park it here for now and we'll pick up with this digestion and absorption. Suite.